like to talk is about the lost trades of Utoxita. Um, we know the town um, many primary trades, particularly more modern ones, such as Bamford's, Elks's, Bunting's, but this talk will focus on some of the older and more forgotten trades that really built Utoxita up and made the town what it was before the more modern industries moved, moved into Utoxita. Tonight's talk will be presented by Dave Marriott, the resident historian and, and one of the trustees at Redfern's Cottage. So what I'll do is I'll hand over to Dave and I will see you all probably towards the end of the talk, which is before we take the break. Um, thank you everyone and over to you, Dave. Okay, um, thanks Gordon. Good evening everybody. Thanks for joining us again, those that uh, are repeat visitors. Um, as Gordon said, this is the first of our talks uh, in 2022. And what a, it's, it's really uh, two talks. Um, what I'm trying to do in these two talks is, is to look at uh, the past of Utoxta in terms of the, the trades that actually built the town and made it so successful. Um, the time period I'm really talking about is between about 1600 and the late 1800s, um, although some of the images that I might be using are slightly later than that uh, to give it some flavour. Um, we could talk about lots and lots and lots of trades um, that have now long gone in Utoxta, but I thought we'd start uh, this evening by looking at the butchers, tanners and candlestick makers. Um, First of all, though, a little bit of context. Um, we need to understand that what we're talking about this evening is a Utox that's that was very different than the Utox that we know today. Um, we're talking about a Utox that was incredibly important, both locally and regionally. And because of that, therefore, business boomed over about a 200, 250 year period. So let's have a look at some of these um, these trades because they were important not only in themselves and the people that, that ran the trades but also in the way that they shaped the town and without them the town wouldn't have developed in in the way that it has done okay this map um, gives us an idea really of um, Utoxeter uh, back in the late 1700s it comes from a, um, a very rare map of 1795 as you can see um, it's, it's in the corner of the map, but, but you will see in that top caption where it says the market. I'll use the cursor now and again to give you where I'm, uh, I'm looking at. So the market, as it says, the market is said to be one of the greatest in England for cattle, sheep, um, by butter, cheese and cork. That gives us a flavour of a Utoxeter that's very different than the one that we know today. The word greatest in England. Um, is, is to us today probably an amazing description of the town. But actually, um, as you look at the town in, in centuries past, it was much, much more important both um, in this area and regionally and nationally uh, than we could ever imagine. There's been very little um, research um, on Utoxeter uh, amongst the academic uh, population. But this quote comes from, from one of the most detailed studies that was done by Angus McKinnon uh, from the University of Kiel in 1987. And Angus, what he did is look at the, um, the parish records and, and, and a huge range of um, detailed documents that still survive for Utoxter. And his conclusion was that he felt that, that the 1700 Utoxter was a leader amongst the towns of Staffordshire. Not only was it a leader among the towns of Staffordshire, but it was a place of national importance. In fact, those of you that have been with me, um, both on talks and also from the walks that I've done in and around the town, will, ha will have heard me mention that, that 1700, uh, the year 1700 in Utoxter, this the town was probably one of the largest, probably one or two uh, in the whole of the county, much bigger than Stafford. Um, and certainly up there with, with uh, Newcastle. Um, of course, the, the towns of the Potteries themselves hadn't developed at this time. So it was a very, very, very important place. And as an important place, therefore, it was a great place to do business. 
But I think before we go to look at those businesses, it might be worth just just taking a, a little step back even further to get a sense of 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 how it started, how these tradesmen that built the town in 1700 and beyond actually came to be here. In 1690, um, Angus McKinnon reckoned there was about 287 tradesmen in 72 occupations. I mean, that's a huge number. These, these are people, these are artisan tradesmen that were making and selling their goods in, in this town. And there was about, as he said, 72 occupations. And there's a, a, a flavour of some of them. Obviously, we're only going to pick one or two of them uh, this evening and, and uh, in our, our next talk. But it gives you a sense that this was a place that was attracting people to come into the, the place to trade, to market their goods and to sell their goods. The Utox of 1690, in fact, um, was probably little, a little short of 5,000 people. Now, that doesn't sound very much today. Um, when you consider the, the mega towns and the mega cities that we have up and down the country. But in those times, this was a big place. Um, if you work out that, I mean, even today, we've only got what, 13,000, 13 and a half thousand people in Utoxa. So 5,000 people is an awful lot of people. And those trades, tradesmen that had come into town and that they'd been attracted um, into the town for some considerable, uh, for over a considerable period, over hundreds of years. And the start of all that um, comes from this time, a long, long time back in 1252. Because in 1252, the town was granted its market charter. And that's a copy of the charter for Utoxeter. What was important for it was that the Lord of the Manor, um, Henry de Ferris, based in Tutbury Castle, had the royal approval for a market to be staged on a Wednesday in the town of Utoxeter. And later on, uh, as the market charter was re renewed, not only was it a Wednesday, but it then became a Friday and then into a Saturday. And it also gave permission to, to stage um, what were called market fairs. These were huge occasions when thousands of people came into town to trade and to buy goods. So this is the beginning. This is why, why people came into town, why people, why tradesmen set themselves up in town. And as part of the market charter, what also happened was that Henry de Ferrers wanted to make sure that the, the town wasn't an, uh, an attractive place to set up. So what therefore accompanied the charters in, in all those uh, centuries past was the idea um, that the Lord of the Manor would lease sections of the town to these tradesmen who were called Burgesses. And the plots of land that, that was leased to them were called Burgage plots. And you'll see Burgage plots in most medieval towns if, if they haven't been completely obliterated by development. What it meant is that these tradesmen not only could have a, a piece of land onto which they would build their house and their workshop and run their business, but it also meant that they were, they were exempt from the normal taxes that were paid to the Lord of the Manor, the 10%, the tithings that everybody else paid. And it also gave them favourable, uh, it put them in a favourable position to actually trade in the town. So, it was a very attractive place to start setting up business, even in 1252. And over the centuries, therefore, it attracted more and more and more people. And it was a bit like a snowball effect. You know, the more tradesmen that you've got in town, the more goods are produced, the more goods that are produced, the more attractive it becomes, and so on and so on and so on. Now, these burgage plots are interesting, are interesting because um, uh, some of them still survive um, in, in the town. And, and the Burgage plots themselves are, are particularly uh, the strips that you can see are long and thin. This is a, a map of 16, the 1658 uh, Peter Lightfoot map. This is um, where my curse is going now. This is the high street uh, here. The market's down at the bottom right hand corner. But these thin strips here over on the right hand side of uh, the, the screen that we can see here are the Burgage plots. 
And if we zoom in a couple of centuries um, forward, um, we will see that those burgage plots still remain. Some of you that know the town very well will know those buildings. Um, essentially what you have got are these two um, 17th century buildings, very um, narrow, both of them, but they go back an awful long way. And those of you that do shop in New Toxter, particularly on, on that side of the high street, will know that if you go into any of the premises, particularly the older premises like those, they go an enormous long way back. Because what you've got there is that the burgage plots were where the tradesmen built both their premises to live, to work and to sell. And to do that, therefore, um, they extended those, those fronts an awful long way back. So if you look at some detail at a map um, uh, later on, or a, an image, I should say, later, um, that was drawn to show so what these would have looked like, you get this. So if you imagine, this is obviously not Utopsa because there's a castle in the top right hand corner, but this is the backs. The back of the property was as important as the front. And what it therefore led to is a shaping of the town to create these burgage plots that then were interlinked. If we zoom in a little bit, you'll see, I'm going to zoom in and look at in some detail, this range of burgage plots here. Now, those of you that know the town, this is the marketplace here, and that's the conduit, um, that was the market cross that disappeared in the mid 19th century. This is Church Street going across here. I'm going to be looking at this particular patch. Now, you, this curve is still followed now by the Victorian buildings that occupy that patch in 2022. But you will notice that, that some of these buildings, particularly are here and here and here and here, go back an enormous long way. And that the buildings themselves crowd round, group together to form these yards. And if we look at this map, this is a, a John Wood map. This is pre ordnance survey. Same, same, exactly the same area. There's the marketplace there, quite clearly put. But look at these burgage plots. These are the trade, the original tradesmen of Utoxter's spaces that, that were leased to them on which they built their homes, their, their shops and their trade. And the others come in from the other directions. Look at this huge one here that come in from Church Street. Um, many of the internal buildings here are long gone, but you get an idea of, of how these areas uh, became tradesmen's yards. And, and this, this took place across, uh, across the town. I put two arrows in here because if you look carefully um, in New Toxter today, you can still make out both these narrow plots and also the alleyways through which you go into what was a huge tradesman's yard. Now, the important thing about you, Toxter, as I've, many people will hear me say many, many times before, is that what you see on the face of it is not actually what's behind. And I mean, mean to say, uh, mean by that, that, that many of the buildings that look brick and look therefore 18th, 19th, even early 20th century are not what they seem. And this is a very good example of. So this is um, a tradesman's yard uh, that we're going to be looking at, which is called Church Yard. There's the church over here. This is tradesman's yard. All these trades will have therefore shared this yard. It is also likely that these trades interlinked, i.e. that they needed each other's products to make a final product, whatever they, um, whatever they were making. Um, I put two arrows because if you look carefully in your toxter uh, in this day and age, you will see that those two entrances are still there. Now there's a horrible shot. Um, there we can see, um, this is uh, looking straight from uh, the high street. There you see the Darwin and Bear, this interesting pub, bar, whatever it is, um, and the hairdressers to the right. But between them, next time, those of you that go into town, 
look down that 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 space that is a public right of way that public right of way has been there certainly um, since 1600 and it's an alleyway into the yard what's interesting about this one is that even though you go to the yard and you'll see at the end of it there is a brick wall originally there would have been a yard an open yard in which people would uh, where the tradesmen would would um, go about their business but the interesting thing is if you walk through it you get a glimpse that what you're walking through dates from um, some considerable time ago so I've walked through it so you walk through it and then you turn back and you see that so there you see in front of you uh, a timbered frame building um, and you see that there's the, the alleyway then now looking back into the marketplace and the important thing about Utoxta is that a lot of these timber frame buildings actually survive behind brick brick fronts and these were the original houses of the tradesmen of early Utoxeter. Um, The others there were basically three big ones um, churchyard that we've just looked at which is over here where the cursor is at the moment there's the burgage plots there was then um, a very big yard here called blacksmith's yard this is ballon street um, so the health current health center is here this is, so all this collection of buildings here was made up of blacksmiths not not um not just making the same product but probably making products that then fed on to their neighbors that then meant that they could make a, um, a, a, a more complicated product. The one that, that people will remember um, if they've come into town recently is the one that's up here, which is which is Sadler's Yard. And Sadler's Yard, of course, is still there and it's still named. And there's Sadler, the entrance to Sadler's Yard from the High Street. Um, so those of you that come on walks with me will know that, you know, I often walk into the Sadler's Yard, into the back there, and this would have been a yard where the saddlers um, and leather um, um, makers and artisans would have practiced their trade. So what we're saying really is that the, the, the way that the trades grew up physically actually influenced the shape of the town. But why was it so wealthy? What, why was it such a great place to, to do business? OK, these, these plots of land were available everywhere. So what made Utoxa special? How did it make its money? Well, really, the secret of, of Utoxa's success were, were those beasts, cows. Um, a lot of uh, the growth of Utoxa from the even from the 1500s onwards was due to the fact uh, that it's a lot of its trade was built on the products of those beasts. Um, those of you from farming communities and know a lot more about farming than me um, will know that the, the land around Utoxta is, is not wonderful for growing arable crops. It can do it, but it needs a lot of work. But it's very good for growing grass. And, and obviously that's then the natural feed for cows and cattle. And it's on the basis of cows and cattle that Utoxta became famous and built its, not only its town wealth, but the wealth of individual people and not only um, uh, just dairy cows but also beef cows so every Wednesday um, this would have been a, the, a, a scene um, typical of, of a, a medi medieval town like Utoxta this is a Victorian image and it's not of Utoxta Unfortunately, nobody ever painted or photographed or, or wasn't able to photograph because it was far too early. But with, nobody ever painted the scene like this has been painted in. This is Norwich. But you can imagine that the marketplace would have actually been flooded with cattle, cattle being driven from from uh, huge distances to be sold in Utoxta. And then around that cattle market, a, a, a huge range of tradesmen that were then using the cows and the products of the cows for their business and it wasn't just milk i'll be talking about cheese um the cheese industry of utox during our, our next talk but it was particularly um important as a town for beef cattle 
Um, and of course, you know, if you look around the lands of Etoxta now, this, you still see a lot of uh, beef cattle, less so dairy in now. But, but at that, it, it, from about 1500s onwards, then it was a seriously important place for beef cattle and the products, therefore, of beef cattle. And what I'm going to be doing in the rest of the talk are looking at the trades that were interlinked, but then developed from that, that product of cattle, of beef cattle particularly. The obvious one are butchers. Um, this scene um, taken from uh, the 1600s, a painting from the 1600s, bit, a little bit graphic, a little bit gory, but would be typical of the butchers um, that would establish themselves in Utoxeter from 1500s onwards. Meat hanging in the streets, often um, the meat, the cattle themselves that had been brought to market would be slaughtered once they'd been sold, either by the butchers themselves very close to the their, their own um, shop or, uh, or there were two um, places that the cows could be killed. Um, one, uh, there was an abattoir up uh, just off the high street and a slaughterhouse um, over on Bradley Street. There's a difference between the two in that the abattoir actually slaughtered and then processed uh, the product of the cow. The abattoir just slaughtered and then passed it on to the butchers um, uh, to, for them to do uh, with it whatever they wanted. But the, the important thing was that this was serious trade. Now, obviously, this is pre-refrigeration. What do you do with that amount of meat? Well, there's obviously both uh, the fresh meat itself, as fresh as they can make it, but then they salted it and they potted it so, so that it could then be preserved for much longer. Now, obviously, today, you know, this is not a trade that's disappeared um, in New Toxter. Um, uh, you know, there are two, two butchers still resident in town, um, but they don't look like that, um, like this. This is Stuart's Butchers, um, which was originally on the marketplace. And there you can see this would be a typical butcher's shop. Um, a scene that could, this particular shot was uh, in the late 1800s, but in, in fact, it would be typical of a butcher's shop in, in 1590. Um, life had changed very little um, for the, for the uh, trade as a butcher, and, and there you can see the carcasses hanging up uh, outside. It was so attractive because you know, you think, well, that's a huge volume of meat. But if you then look at um, the numbers of butchers that were in town, you get some idea as to how, how much of a trade it actually was. What I've done here um, is, is zoom up to 1834. The reason I've done that is that as you go back in time, it's very difficult to get actual factual evidence of who was who uh, and where they were. But but from uh, the late 1700s onwards, you get things called trade directories that then list um, the occupations and where those occupations resided. This slide shows you the, the number and distributions of Utox, the butchers in 1834. And you can see the numbers indicate the numbers on the street. Um, so there's five on the high street, there's two on Carter Street, there's two in the middle of, of uh, what, just off um, Church Street, Church Lane as was then. There's one here uh, on the marketplace. And you'll see that there's, there's, there's two here on this very narrow street called um, Sheep Street, uh, Market Street as it's now called, and two on Spicefield Street. And Spicefield Street now no longer exists, but it's the car park that's at the back of Trinity Square. And, and you've got to remember that this is a time when the street pattern, even though the street pattern of Utoxta looks very similar now um, to what it did then, Spicefield Street, coming in from the bottom right hand corner of, this, of the slide, was a very important thoroughfare, linking down to the Hotley Brook and then up and over to the other side. So the butchers were located as close as they could get to the market where the cows came and then as close as they could be to the main trading uh, centre of the town um, which was the marketplace. 
They also locate, of course, where the people are. Um, walking through pedestrian New Toxter High Street, you know, today, um, you forget that this was a major, major thoroughfare. The reason why there's so many butchers is not only because there's so much meat being produced in and around the area, but also because the market um, for their products was enormous. Um, you've got to uh, remember that not only was this a large town for the time, about 5,000, but certainly on market day and, and also uh, those uh, festival days, uh, those trade days, um, then the population doubled. So there's a huge trade um, and people knew that if they wanted to buy their fresh meat um, or their preserved meat, they could come into one of those butchers that existed uh, in Utoxta. Um, it's obviously a very profitable trade. Um, for example, um, the reason I, you think, well, what's he talking about this for? Well, there's there's the old Tolbert. The old Tolbert um, was actually originally um, owned by a butcher in in seven, in 1640s, um, a guy called John Dines. John Dines was so successful uh, as a butcher um, that he also um, bought and ran the old Tolbert uh, pub. And when he died in 1644, he decided um, that he would, in his will, leave the pub um, to a trust that would then give money um, from the takings of the old Tolbert to support the apprentices of poor boys into the trades of Utoxta. John Dines has started, you know, from nothing. It, it, it actually developed um, his trade incredibly around the marketplace. And he was a rich man. He was a very rich man. And so when he died, he wanted to pass on some of that to support the poor of Utoxta. So it, it, was a, it was a trade to be in, most definitely. Also, what was uh, a trade to be in was all the byproducts. Um, we often, you know, don't think of the byproducts um, of, of uh, the slaughtered animal. But you can see on the left hand side, um, this, this quote, this is quite a late quote, late Victorian quote. But as it's intriguing, really, because it describes your toxta of 1870 as a town of brewing. And some of you have heard me talk about the brewing industry before. Cork, and I'll be talking about that um, in the next talk, but leather and glue. Nothing was wasted. Um, and as you can see from this uh, slide, um, both not only was the meat uh, uh, an important uh, trade and industry for Utoxta, but also all the byproducts, the hide and the hair, the blood and the sinew, uh, the in, internal uh, parts of, of the animal and the bone, everything, but everything was used. And there were trades built up without, within the town that used everything, absolutely everything. Nothing at all was spared. And we're going to look at a couple of those trades. I'd like to look at more of them, um, but some of them, are, 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 the details are just lost, but some of them still survive. And we're going to have a look, therefore, particularly to begin with, at leather. We forget um, in this days of synthetic materials, plastics, all sorts of things that uh, we have and wear and use that are made of a whole range of man-made materials, that in the past it was natural materials that therefore were used to make a whole range of things and leather was particularly common. When Angus McKinnon did his research in the 1980s, he reckoned that a third of all those tradesmen, um, those 287 tradesmen in Utoxeter, um, were actually employed in some way in the leather industry, not as butchers, but in, in an industry that was using the byproducts of the animal, and particularly leather. Um, so in order to, to do that, um, obviously there needs to be a whole range of processing trades to turn an animal's skin 
into a product like this. The other thing that um, we forget, uh, and I'm no expert at all on horses, um, but we forget that most, if you didn't walk, uh, you went by horse and cart or carriage. And so the number of horses um, being used in and out of town and on the land was huge. Uh, and in order to therefore to control those horses, there's a whole range of, of um, leashes, collars, pads, as you can see on that diagram, um, that, that enabled the horse to be controlled. All of those were made out of leather and all of those were traditionally made in Utoxter. It was even um, a, a greater um, trade for Utoxter um, because every single year for the best part of a century, um, there was a horse market in town. This is a great photograph by a great pho uh, Utoxter photograph, uh, photographer Al Alfred McCann of the horse fair. This is Ballon Street. Um, so you're looking down Ballon Street from probably where the health centre now is, a Ballon Street surgery. So every year there would be hundreds and hundreds of horses coming into town, um, a same number of traders. And so the market for leather, saddles, reins, everything that a horse um, would need um, uh, was incredible. And so the leather industry unsurprisingly was it very very important to the town it was also, it also made people very rich even from an early date i, I mean this is an interesting one you know there there's um uh it's obviously a, a an early 20th century um photograph um but above it it shows you just how much was was being made by by leather um and the tanning of leather and the, and the skins from the cows. This is um, uh, from the will of a chap called Edward Taylor. And the Taylors were, were very prominent in, in the leather industry for centuries in Utoxto. He died as long ago as 1597 and, he, and his estate on his death was worth 325 pounds. Now that doesn't sound an awful lot of money in today's, um, today's currency um but in fact if you convert it in, into 2022 currency it's about a million pounds um the man was a millionaire equivalent in 1597 on the basis of leather um so it was a seriously important and there were, and there were several like him um making a huge amount of money now, obviously, to prepare those skins that you saw the guys um, hauling, you, you've got to actually get rid of the, the, the hair and get the leather into a state so it doesn't rot uh, and also is malleable so it can be made into a variety of products. This, this modern photograph, um, which, is, which is actually um, just outside, is in Marrakesh in, in Morocco, shows the traditional way of of uh, preparing the skins uh, into uh, the, what will be leather in the end. These big vats um, are filled with, in, the way that they do it here is they also include the dye, but in, in, essentially they create a liquid that's made, that's, that's mainly water, but also has lime in it. And certainly in uh, 17th and 18th century Utoxter, the other addition that went into it was urine. Now, I've seen evidence elsewhere in other towns of there being urine collectors. Forgive me if you're having your tea or just have your tea or you're about to have your tea. Um, but urine was a very important um, additive to um, those vats that were preparing the skins to then be turned into leather. And if any of you have ever visited an outdoor tannery like that, as I have, it stinks. It's absolutely awful. So wherever the, the tanneries were in town, you can imagine that the odours coming off that though those premises were incredible. And in fact, there were three, certainly in, in by 1800, there were three tanneries 
in town because to produce all those leather goods then there needs to be a lot of preparation of the skin to make it into something that you then can be used and made into a product the three um tanners uh, of eight by 1800 in town were those john bird william shipley um and john and thomas frost um in pinfold street um there's a nice lovely etching of an interior um tannery um still huge huge horrible smelly um occupation and trade but one that was very profitable the reason i um i've emphasize John and Thomas Frost because it was their um, tannery that lasted the longest and in fact lasted well into uh, the end of the uh, 1800s and it was on Pinfold Street. Now Pinfold Street today is a dead end um, but in 18 by 1890s it was a very different um, place. It's a dead end to traffic that is. The tannery, this is a, one, the first, one of the first OS maps of Futoxta. Um, it was surveyed in 1897. So just to give you an orientation, there's uh, Carter Street, the Marketplace, there's Bannon Street. This is Pinfold Street. Here it is. Uh, now there's nothing on Pinfold Street. At that time, there was lots of houses. And you'll see marked where my arrows pointed to is the tannery. Now, the reason why, why it survived there where the others disappeared was that the, the, it was considered in the mid uh, 19th century such an odious trade and gave out such a horrible smell that many tann tanneries were closed down near the centre of towns and only those that were on the edge of towns survived. And so this tannery um, was the last one in Utoxter. And you can see there's the railway line. So um, it's butted right up to the railway line. Um, and the important thing uh, for this tannery that made it very profitable and very suitable was the Hotley Brook. And that's that blue line that you can see whittling here over and round through the town. Now that was, as you can see from the previous slide, you, ne you, needed, a, you need a lot of water in order to, to, to cure and to tan the the skins and make them into something that beginning to look like leather and they therefore took the water from the hotly brook um, to do it in that tannery the downside was that in fact all the residue all the rubbish um, the water that had been used um, unfortunately it was then tipped into the hotly brook um, and so if you uh, lived towards the east of town all this horrible water was going out and away and there's some reports uh, that often um, much disease was caused by the fact that people who use the Hartley Brook for their main water supply or their, their main washing point were uh, were taking hugely contaminated water that had come out of the tannery um, but that's where it was so today what does it look like well today it looks a bit like that so this is this is um, Pinfold Street and this is uh, at the back, that's uh, Balance Street, that's the police station. Um, there's a pedestrian crossing now, but originally it was a through route for cars. So that's what it looks like now. There's the bridge there uh, over the Hotley Brook. Um, so what would it have looked like when there was a tannery there? Now remember, Balance Street was a seriously posh street um, at this time until we get a tannery because the tannery would have looked like that uh, um, but, and and the water source that you can see in the middle shot would have gone the other way would have been the hotly brook but you can see these open vats into which the skins would have gone and then been hung up in these huge scaffolding structures to dry now, this is a huge one um, that is it's an etching of a tannery in London, but it gives you the idea um, of what a horrible mess this would have been. And if you've got a posh house on Ballon Street, uh, this is not what you want on your doorstep. 
So what happened to the leather once they they'd, uh, tanned it? Well, the 1834 um, directory, trade directory, gives us an idea. And these are um, occupations um, that were uh, associated then with the process, the, the process leather. The, the first one, the th couriers, Dorothy Bull, John Fox and John Hudson, the couriers are the final finishes of the leather. They're the ones that perhaps add an initial dye, certainly make sure it's polished, certainly make sure that it's in a state to use. The saddlers are obvious, um, but look, there are five saddlers operating successfully in Utoxta. I've highlighted the, the name Woolly um, because it, it was that family that survived right up into the 20th century as saddle makers. So uh, there's a, um, uh, a courier um, that's, that's actually preparing the leather, softening the leather, and over on the right hand side there's an etching of a, an old saddler's shop. Um, and there is Mr. Woolley's shop. Um, what is in fact um, uh, a beam saddlers and leather um, makers or leather product makers for some considerable time before that shot was taken. Um, this is Mr. Herbert Woolley. Um, the whole family um, were involved in the trade and his grandchildren. The shot's taken um, the, probably about 1890. Um, and many of you that have lived in the Utox for a long time will remember Mr. Woolley's, will remember Woolley's shop. Um, it's on the, it, the church is to the left, would be to the left of the shop. It's now um, a hairdresser's, I think. Um, and many people that have, we've, we've talked to recently in the museum um, speak lovingly of that smell of leather in Woolley's um, Sadler's leather shop and where they bought their sack satchels for school all the way until it closed in into the 1980s um, so woolies were very prominent saddlers not only were they prominent but they were regarded as as very high class saddlers um, and eventually got um, the approval of of the contract to supply horses to the police to the uh, armies in the first war uh, and also uh, to the police force um, all the way uh, into the late 20th century. But the other thing that, that was um, obviously uh, to be to be a, an important trade in your toxter, if you've got plenty of leather, you could make lots of shoes. And in 1834, there were 21 shoemakers um, in uh you talk to her, 21 shoemakers gives you an idea of um, what what trade there was coming through town. And this is where they were. Um, most of these are relatively straightforward and you can see where they are. This one here is Little Bromshaw, uh, which is actually the it's, it's, it's the roads leading out uh, of, of town, Smithfield Road, really then because um, it was the edge of town and almost in, into, into Bramshaw as we know it now it was called Little Bromshaw but they had 21 shoemakers or cordwainers um, uh, that were in operation uh, in Utoxter in 1834 using that leather and this scene would have been a common scene um, throughout the town um, where, where individual pairs of shoes were made for, for customers. One thing that we forget about um, is how life has changed. Um, and this shot has got nothing at all to do with leather, um, but it's got something to do with a, with a byproduct of cows. This is a scene um, of 17th century town, it could be anywhere, and people struggling through the twilight, through the darkness, uh, to see where they're going. Um, we forget, I think, uh, how difficult it would have been to see anything at night um, because we're surrounded by electric lamps, uh, electric lights. We're surrounded um, by things that make nighttime into daylight. Um, yet, 
for centuries, for absolutely many, many, um, many, many years, light at night was very, very difficult um, to recreate and led to all sorts of problems. And of course, as you can see in, in um, that particular painting, um, often what was used, either um, oil lamps, if you've got plenty of money, or more importantly, uh, or more commonly, I should say, over on the right hand side, as I would, wouldn't like to be in that particular barber's, they were using candlelight. And of course, candles could be created, um, uh, created could be created by beeswax, but that was very expensive. So the more common um, source was actually the rendered fat from the cows. Remember what I was saying, nothing was wasted um, at all from this incredible trade and linked set of industries that were, uh, were to do with cows and cattle. So what's this building got to do with anything? Well, this is a contemporary shot. I shot it just before Christmas um, of a little building on the marketplace. Uh, it's now hairdressers and you can see the black and white building on the left hand side is a watch shop now. It's interesting in, in, in that we, we know quite a lot about that building. Um, Redfern's Cottage Archive has a rich source of um, information and documents that otherwise would have been thrown away. And we have a lot of documents not about every pro a property in, in town by, by no means, but, but we do have some documents about this property. And about five years ago, a chap came in to the museum uh, on a Tuesday, which is when myself and the other archivists are in, and said, I bought at an auction this property. Uh, and I wonder whether or not you can tell me something about it only because when I started to alter it and recreate it, it's not what it seemed. Many of you that have know, uh, known that property will know that McCracken's opticians were in it for many, many decades. Um, but that's what, how it looks now. So this chap come, comes into the museum and says, um, well, um, as I've been knocking down the inside walls, I suddenly discover that actually it's a timber frame building. And as, as I said at the beginning of, of, of the talk, many of the buildings on the marketplace, not the one on the left, by the way, but many of the others um, are timber frame, but have a, a brick um, facade. He said, first of all, it's timber framed. But then he said it's got a, a, a quite a big cellar, a, a much bigger cellar. Um, than he'd anticipated. And he said, there's some really peculiar uh, features in the cellar. And he said, one of the things that struck me, he said, I thought cellars were just storage areas, but in the corner of this cellar was this enormous fireplace, absolutely enormous fireplace. And he said, could you tell me um, what it is? Now, we never actually went into the cellar, although I did see some, some photographs of what he was talking about. And what in fact this chap had bought is that building, but he'd actually bought the original premises of Thomas Cope, the Toxtatolo handler. He'd bought the, the premises that had originally been the candlestick makers. And that very big fireplace was like this one. This etching you can see um, shows a very big fireplace where they're burning up the fat. Um, from the animals that had been slaughtered, probably in the marketplace nearby. And here you can see um, this chap's cutting the wicks that will go into um, the centre of the candle. And here you can see the candles themselves being dipped into hot fat. And here they're being hung, hung out to dry. So this, that little building that we saw earlier, was in fact the building of Thomas Cope. The candle maker of Utoxta. And we know even more about that because in uh, our documents in the museum, we also have 
the sale of that premises. So when this premises was sold in 1868, here's a list of everything that was found within it. And you can see all the implements of a candle maker, a, a small, the large furnace, a small furnace, the dipping machines, the wick machines, a little crane that, that moved things around, weighing machines and fat tubs and all the things that make a candle maker. What was more, also more interesting, uh, as interesting, it, first of all, he was, he was absolutely amazed that, that he'd, he'd actually bought the candle maker's shop. Um, and we knew that it was the candle maker's shop. But was all, all, what was also interesting about that premises um, added, added something to this idea of connected trades. And it, and it gives us a sort of clue that these trades might have been connected in other ways. Because he said, what is also in this cellar is therefore a tunnel or the entrance to a tunnel. And in it, it looks a bit like this. This is not his photograph, but he's a, a photograph very similar to the one that he showed us. So here in underneath the candle makers um, was the entrance to, you could see through um, the breeze blocks or the pile of bricks that, that was on his. And you could see beyond into darkness. And what appears, what there appears to be, although there's no documentation, there's lots of stories. There appears to be not only a set of trade connections running on the surface of the marketplace, butchers, linking up to tanners, linking up to shoemakers, linking up to saddlers, link, and so on. But there also seems to be a connection underneath the marketplace, probably therefore linking into a, a set of tunnels underneath the marketplace. Now this is, um, story um there are no plans although I, I i i do believe from talking to others that have of shopkeepers that have sellers that they too have entrances uh, to other places beyond their sellers and it and it seems that there could well be this connected network of tunnels running um up and through the marketplace it could well be, therefore, that what used to happen was that as the, the raw material, i.e. The, the, the fat or indeed the meat for the butcher or whatever it is, was slaughtered very close to the marketplace, it was then dropped immediately, probably through trap doors, into the cellars of the tradesmen's premises. Now, this isn't a uh, trapdoor that's outside the candle makers, because uh, I had a look the other day. There is an opening, but it could well be that the raw material, the, the fat from the animal was being dropped straight into um, the candle makers. And who knows, therefore, um, his products were being moved both overground and, and underground. So a fascinating, um, little clue that needs a bit more research about how trade and trade, uh, the old trades of Utoxta actually existed. The sale of the candle makers though, um, uh, that sale that we saw there, um, marked a time for Utoxta when things are not great. Um, I said right at the beginning of the talk that, that actually, you know, Utoxta was boomtown. It was a boom town between about 1600 and probably about 1850. But by the time you get to the, this sale, um, 1850, 1860 um, onwards, then Utoxta is not the place to make lots of money. Um, development, the country's development has overtaken it. Um, it relies on its, its manufacturer, its processing of agricultural products. Agriculture has declined significantly from 1800 onwards, from about 1750 onwards. Where the money is, is in, is in iron, as in coal, as in cotton. It's not in processing of agricultural products. 
So Utoxa's traditional artisan trades don't get the business coming through the town. The town is not growing from 1850. In fact, it declined slightly in number. Whereas the industrial um, mega cities like Birmingham and Bristol, Manchester and Leeds are, are, are growing astronomically, um, then Utox is not. So, so as the town and its relative position within the region and the country changes and declines, so you therefore get a change in the decline of, of the artisan, the tradesman, the individual um, tradesperson that actually makes products that would be then sold into town. What doesn't help um, is also the fact that society is beginning to change. So the products, most people for centuries had brought their, uh, uh, if they couldn't produce them themselves, had bought their products in the market place of Utoxta, in the shops of the tradesmen of the town. But consumerism is, is developing rapidly in the Victorian era. And now, instead of having small, home produced sh um, products um, from small shops in town, these mega stores, now they're not mega stores compared with today's mega stores, are coming into um, prominence. These are two from early 20th century Utoxta. Um, the left hand side, if that's the watch company, was um, Orms. Um, those of you um, that know the town well know that that was Orms, part of Orms department store called the London store built in 1910. And to stock st such stores, um, they bought products from all over the place. Um, they didn't just buy them from the, the people on the doorstep um, that had been making these products, but were buying them from other parts of the UK, all over the world. Products were coming in and people wanted products from all over the world. Similarly, you know, the co-op that used to be on the end uh, at the end of the Carter Street, which is where the Barbers was, the Barbers is now, um, you know, its products were not produced in Utoxtus. Some of them might have been. But the competition, therefore, against these artisan tradespeople was enormous. And so the decline started and, and started um, quite significantly from about 1850 onwards. Um, Pat Turner, who was a curator at the museum 40 years ago, um, did some research that showed in a very short period of time that on Carter Street, for example, then, then the decline in, in tradespeople um, between, um, even between about 1850 and 1912 was very significant. Um, their decline was about 40%. Um, they could no longer compete. The, the world had changed around them. The town was no longer important. And sadly, therefore, they went into decline. Now, for some, it was a slow decline, but for, for others, it was much more rapid, um, particularly uh, as it was easy, as it became easier, often through the railways, which had a double, was a double-edged sword for you, Doxter. On the one end, you could get your um, uh, produce away, but it also meant that other people could get their produce to your Doxter. So it, it, it was a double-edged sword, really, um, for the town. But it meant, um, that time meant a slow and, and considerable decline. So I suppose when we look at Utoxa today um, and you look around its shape and, and how it is and, it, and, it's, and its nooks and crannies, much of it thankfully survives and much of it owes its existence to, the, to these lost trades. These lost trades built the town. These lost trades made people very wealthy. Those, these lost trades attracted people to coming to town. But as times change, then those trades declined and many of them were lost forever. But they were important. 
and if you look close enough you can still see the signs where they might have been thank you very much our first question like comes from Stephen um, and he's interested about the salting of meats so regarding the salting of meats where did the salt come from um, nearby approximately 10 miles in the direction of Stafford is the village of salt and um, is this linked to that at all um, highly likely we, there's no records that actually say where it's coming from but it could have come from a variety of sources because um, it's heavy um, to transport it's likely that salt um, was the nearest source but but also you know there's quite an extensive salt trade that was coming in from Cheshire from the Northwich area um, so it could have been an old combination I suppose it's it depends on who was offering salt at the cheapest price um, but but local would have been better um, because of the transport costs um, you know moving it uh, particularly in times of, of very very poor transport routes was a problem um, and so it needed to be fairly local they did move some um, looking at the the, uh, the the goods that were moving along uh, those those 40 years that the canal exists they did move some by barge um, from areas that were far, far, far uh, further away but then you've still got to pay the the, the barge costs um, in order to get it to town so the nearer the better really Okay. Um, our next question is from Robert and Carol, and they're asking, uh, there was a Kinnersley saddle maker. Is there any connection with the Kinnersleys of Loxley Hall and Mr. Kinnersley, the yeah. owner of the, the, yeah. the High Street? Yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, the, the short answer is, yeah, I, I, I would have thought so. Um, the Kinnersley family have been in Utoxter for many centuries um they were certainly uh important landowners and tradesmen uh, in and around the town uh, by 1600 um and there are many branches of kindleys like like we see in our own family trees uh and inevitably they would have they would have been related um but i, I don't know how the relationship works because i don't know enough about the kindleys fa family tree but the name is very particular um to this area so i would thought there's definitely a relationship okay um actually that yeah, makes the end of the questions um if anyone has any more questions if you just quickly type if you can quickly type them in we'll come through them if not i think what we'll probably do is draw tonight to a close um so i'll just like to say thank you for everyone for joining us